Good morning, First Korean, and welcome to everyone who is joining with us today. And thank you to everyone who's taking part. Today is Remembrance Day. Peter reminds us, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Our reading this morning comes from Judges chapter 17. Now a man named Micah from the hill country of Ephraim said to his mother, the 1100 shekels of silver that were taken from you and about which I heard you utter a curse, I have that silver with me. I took it. Then his mother said, The Lord bless you, my son. When he returned the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, she said, I solemnly consecrate my silver to the Lord for my son to make a carved image and a cast idol. I will give it back to you. So he returned the silver to his mother and she took 200 shekels of the silver and gave them to a silversmith who made them into an image and the idol, and they were put in Micah's house. Now this man Micah had a shrine, and he made an ephod and some idols, and installed one of his sons as his priest. In those days Israel had no king, everyone did as he saw fit. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, your love embraces all of creation. Your kingdom knows nothing of the borders we draw between nations. You've taught us that every woman, man and child is our neighbour. You've commanded us to love without thought of our own security or glory or gain. Your blessing is upon the poor and the meek and the peacemaker. We remember those who have lost their lives as a result of war. Young soldiers dispatched to far off places never to return. And civilians, young and old, caught in the crossfire of conflict. Lord, bring healing to families torn apart by war. Comfort those who mourn for loved ones. We remember those who have been psychologically wounded by the horrors of war, who find themselves unable to live with the burden. Loving Father, bring healing to hearts and minds that are broken. We confess the ecological cost of war, the landscapes that bear the scars of bombing, the soil and water poison, the destruction of habitats and creatures. Loving God, bring healing to the earth. Make a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. We remember those living now under oppressive regimes or in the midst of violence and conflict. The millions displaced from their homes to refugee camps. The communities struggling on with their daily lives under the shadow of war, fearing for their lives and the lives of their children. Loving God, bring healing to nations where there is unrest and where all can live in dignity and safety. We remember those who campaign for peace, who seek and encourage reconciliation and resolutions to conflict, and those who in their lives model the radical forgiveness that Christ himself taught and demonstrated. Loving God, bring healing to communities. Forgiveness where there is hurt. Compassion where there is hatred. Love where there is fear. Father, graciously hear us. In Jesus' name. Amen. It is with gratitude and affection that we remember those from this congregation who in two world wars answered the call of duty and did not return. 
George Armstrong, Alfred Bell, Jack Boone, Miller Hutton, Thomas Martin, William Martin, Robert McNeil, and Thomas Moody. Hugh Mullen, Joseph Pollock, Arnold Todd, John Wright, Ernest Glenn, John Maguire, Robert Purdy, and Andrew Charles Reed. They shall not grow old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in power just green he leads me by the still still waters his goodness restores my soul and I will trust in you alone and I will trust Guides my ways in righteousness, and he anoints my head with oil, and my cup it overflows with joy. I feast on his pure delights, and I will trust. trust in you alone for your endless mercy
darkest time I will not fear the evil one for you are with me and your rod and staff are the comfort I need to know and I will trust in I will trust in you alone For your endless mercy follows me And your goodness will lead me home And I will trust in you alone And I will trust in you Judges 17 to 21 are five of the darkest, most disastrous and dismal and depraved chapters in the Bible. We come to the final part of our Deliverer series. At last, you say. In many ways, the end of the story of Samson is actually the end of the story of Judges. We end up with a dead judge and no deliverance. But then we turn the page and find chapter 17, and we soon realize that these next chapters are not in chronological order. They don't continue the story after Samson died. They are chapters that give us an understanding of what life was like in Israel during the time of the Judges. If you remember, we started our study with a double introduction to the book of Judges in chapter 1 and 2. Now, in these final chapters, we close the book with a double conclusion, two stories. And the stories tell us why Israel needed delivering. This is what life was like in Israel when, as the author tells us repeatedly, they did what was right in their own eyes. Here is a description of human depravity that I don't believe I have ever heard a sermon preached on. And I reckon from what I have discovered these past weeks, you haven't either. The first story is about a man named Micah, whom we are told is from Ephraim, such a pleasant boy, who stole 1,100 shekels of silver from his own mother. But when she called down a curse on the thief, he confessed. And in just a few words, you get a picture of the man. He had weak morals and even weaker principles. When she heard that her son was the thief, immediately she reversed the curse and sought a blessing on him instead. No need for repentance, no need for forgiveness. With parenting like that, you can understand why Micah was the way he was. In blessing her son, she called on the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. Not Dagon, not Molech, not Baal. And you think, okay. But then, just like Aaron and the golden calf, she told her son to make idols from the silver. A blatant disregard for the second commandment. The commandment that says not to make any image of God and bow down to worship it. Why does it say that? Well, because any image of God cannot fully represent him. And so it would distort our view of who God really is. You see, the problem is that bowing down to idols that are made to depict God reveal a spirit that does not want to submit to God as he really is. A spirit that 
wants to pick and choose which attributes of God's character are palatable and acceptable in our eyes. Now, of course, you don't have to actually smelt down silver to do that. How many times have you heard someone say, I don't believe in a God like that. I like to think of God as such and such. There are many people, some who even call themselves Christian, who have consciously rejected the Bible as revelation from God. And they say things like, we don't accept a God who does this or who forbids that. It just wouldn't be fair if he did that. What they're really saying is, the culture around us finds what the Bible says distasteful. So we have to let go of the idea that is revelation. We have to fashion a God that fits our sensibilities. So it ends up that the culture shapes hearts instead of God shaping hearts. Do you know, it's amazing what sin you can have a real peace about when culture is shaping your heart. But when we allow that to happen, it becomes impossible to have a real personal relationship with God. When we simply ignore the parts of God we don't like, it means that we can never really know him. We never have a God who ever says no to us. We never let him make demands of us. We have fashioned a God that is tame, a God we can control. But such a God is no God at all. When it actually came to it, even though she had promised all the silver, Micah's mother didn't actually give it all. She kept 900 shekels for herself and gave 200 for the idols. It is easy to have all the God language, but in reality to be, to be far from him. When you've shaped your own God, you can preach a good sermon on John 3:16, but in life and business and family, you can be as ruthless and shady as everybody else. So Micah made a shrine in his home conveniently forgetting what God had said about the tabernacle being the only place for sacrifice and worship. He set up his own sanctuary with his son as priest. Though eventually he found a Levite for hire. What a Levite from Bethlehem was doing in Ephraim is anybody's guess. But he was obviously not where he was supposed to be. Do you see how worship for Micah and his family had become one of personal preference? The faith of God's people is fundamentally a revealed faith. God reveals himself to us in his word. We don't discover him simply through reason or through experience, but through revelation. But instead, Micah and his family had fashioned a God that they found convenient and comfortable. That's what, do, well, that's what doing what is right in your own eyes often looks like. It doesn't have to be out and out rejection of God. It doesn't have to mean that you give up on religious activity. It just means that you have a religion of your own ideas and your own preferences. It won't ever bring any rescue or blessing or personal relationship with God. Though Micah and his mother hoped it would. In verse 13, Micah says, Now I know that the Lord will prosper me because I have a Levite as priest. And then we meet desperate Dan. The tribe of Dan is that tribe that is conspicuous by its absence in the list of tribes of Israel in Revelation chapter 7. We're told the Danites were seeking a place of their own. Even though God had given them an allotment and all they had to do was trust him and fight courageously. But Dan didn't like that idea much. 
it was too difficult. So instead, they remained trapped in the hill country. But now in chapter 18, they thought they would search out something a bit easier. Like Micah, they were restless and felt alienated because they refused to obey God. God had told them where to live, but they didn't like it and decided to do what they thought was better, what was right in their own eyes. And en route to finding an easier yoke, they stopped at Micah's house, and they asked Micah's Levite if God would bless them in their quest. Assured by a pagan Levite working at an idolatrous shrine, they found a good land at the source of a river, one they would eventually call Jordan, flowing out of Dan. It was a land that they could take in their own strength without relying on God. So on their way back, they turned aside to steal Micah's shrine for themselves. It had been such a great help to them. And they convinced the pagan Levite that the pay and conditions would be far better for him if he accompanied them. We're left in no doubt whom this Levite served himself. He began serving God in Bethlehem and Judah, in the foremost tribe, and in the town at the center of God's purposes. Then he moved to Ephraim to serve in an idolatrous shrine and ended up at Laish, outside the land that God had given, working to a tribe who would not reach heaven. On his own terms, he probably felt pretty important, running the worship for an entire tribe. But eternally, what a waste. Then Micah discovered everything he had built was gone. And so he got up and went after the Danites. But they simply told him, go home or we will kill you. That's what happens when you do what is right in your own eyes. It becomes survival of the fittest. Might becomes right. Fear rules. It must have been a pretty bitter blow for Micah. But at least he discovered the emptiness of his gods before he died. And I pray it wasn't too late. Micah's gods had been taken away and he said, I have been left with nothing. You have taken everything. But I want you to know that Jesus isn't like that. He will never leave us, never forsake us. We might lose everything else, but if we know that Jesus is ultimately all we have, we discover that he is eternally all we need. There's one sad twist to the tale. We're told that at the end of the story, the name of the Levite is Jonathan, son of Gershon. He's a descendant of Moses. The Levite who compromised on everything except his own interests belonged to the house of Moses. Do you see how sin works? It doesn't actually make people incredibly wicked or violent. It just makes people empty, politically correct, yes, even nice, but underneath, empty, scraping and clutching for power and control. And in the end, might becomes right. Micah had robbed his own mother, and then the Danites robbed him. The second story is also about a Levite. And the opening verse of chapter 19 is pretty ominous. In those days, when there was no king in Israel, it's a warning again that what follows was right in the eyes of Israel, but evil in the eyes of the Lord. The first Levite was religiously self-serving. The second Levite was relationally self-serving. We're told that he had a concubine 
a second-class wife, a woman that he owned. Even though God had forbidden it, Israel often allowed the nations around them and, uh, to influence them, and they, they followed them and practiced polygamy. And it always brought heartache, without exception. A Levite, who was supposed to be set apart as holy, had a concubine. Isn't that incredible? And we're told that she had an affair, and she left her master, and she returned to her father in Bethlehem. Four months passed, obviously. He didn't really miss her that much. But he eventually went to find her. And her father was overly zealous with his hospitality. Obviously, he hoped that the Levite wouldn't press charges. But neither the father nor the Levite seemed to care anything for the woman. They neither inquired nor cared about what she wanted. To them, she was just a thing, a piece of property. You'll notice that names are not mentioned in this story. It's as if the author is trying to tell us that this is what it was like right across Israel at this time. This is how Levites lived. This is how fathers behaved. This is how women were treated. It really is a dark picture. Eventually, the Levite and his concubine set off home toward Jebus. We know it now as Jerusalem. A town that should have been under the tribe of Benjamin, but because of their disobedience, it wasn't. Ironically, the Levite wasn't keen to go into Jebus as it was a Canaanite town. He thought he would get a warmer welcome in Gibeah because they were Benjamites. But when they entered the town of Gibeah, all was not well. They didn't get the offer of hospitality that they should have expected. Not until an old Ephraimite warned them not to spend the night in the town square and eventually welcomed them into his home. And immediately you ask yourself, what was so dangerous about spending the night in the square? This town belonged to Benjamin, Jacob's favorite son. Well, very quickly we find out Behold, the men of the city, worthless fellows, surrounded the house, beating on the door. And they said to the old man, The master of the house, bring out the man who came into your house that we may know him. And the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said, No, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Since this man has come into my house, do not do this vile thing. Behold, here are my virgin daughter and his concubine. Let me bring them out now. Violate them and do with them what seems good to you. But against this man, do not do this outrageous thing. But the man would not listen to him. So the man seized his concubine and made her go out to them, and they knew her and abused her all night until the morning. And as the dawn began to break, they let her go. And as morning appeared, the woman came and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was until it was light. It was Sodom and Gomorrah all over again. Only this time, it wasn't pagans. It was people who had been given the blessings of the covenant, the law, the prophets, the exodus, the tabernacle, the deliverers. Unbelievably, the next morning, the Levite shouted at her, get up and let's get going, as if nothing had happened only to find that she did not answer. She did not move. She lay lifeless. 
he picked up her battered body and took it home with him. And then he chopped her into 12 pieces and sent a piece to each of the tribes. He cared nothing for her. He wanted vengeance against the Benjamites for what they had done, but only because he had lost his property. Well, we're told Israel was united as one man against Benjamin. (laughs) What irony. They hadn't done that at any time for any of the judges, but as one man they rose up against Benjamin. The Benjaminites wouldn't negotiate, wouldn't identify the rapists and the murderers, and so civil war ensued. And it didn't go smoothly. There was attack and counterattack. Israel was fighting for a cause. The Benjamites were fighting for their lives. But it ended in almost total slaughter. When the battle was done, Israel realized that the tribe of Benjamin had been decimated. And because the men of Israel had taken an oath that they would not give their daughters in marriage to any Benjaminite, it looked like the tribe of Benjamin was lost, completely lost. But then Israel discovered that the men of Jabesh Gilead had not turned up to the fight and had not made the oath. So Israel attacked their town, killed all of the men, and carried off 400 women to give to the remaining Benjamite men. But it wasn't enough. So they told the Benjaminites, go and steal women from a harvest festival at Shiloh. A hundred brides for a hundred brothers. And that way, they wouldn't be oath breakers because, after all, stealing wasn't the same as giving. When you're doing what is right in your own eyes, you're constantly looking for loopholes instead of loyalty. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Israel was functioning just like a pagan culture. Decisions were being made on what they thought was right at the time, hastily, selfishly, based on faulty reasoning, if not outright vengeance. But that is what happens when human solutions are sought for spiritual problems. There is no military campaign or political alliance or social policy that can solve a problem that lies in the human heart. Only a change of heart can do that. When a society is not centered on God, people just do what is right in their own eyes, do what they think is logical and reasonable, and then wonder why things never seem to get any better and indeed only get worse. But we miss the point of these chapters unless we see that these stories aren't stories for pagan nations. They are stories about God's people. The stories are for us. As Daniel Block writes, this book is a wake-up call for a church moribund in its own selfish pursuits. Instead of letting Jesus Christ be Lord of the church, Congregations and their leaders do what is right in their own eyes. How quickly we build idols and bow down to worship them and end up in apostasy. As we've seen in the book of Judges, the author is constantly pointing us to our need of a deliverer. But no ordinary human deliverer will ever be enough. We need a deliverer who can come without being called, for we refuse to seek God, refuse to cry out. We need a deliverer who will choose us, for we can't choose him. And he will have to do this deliverance all by himself, for we are not able And he will need to do more than change our circumstances. 
you will have to change our hearts. Let me finish with these words of hope. Let me share the words of a much greater Micah. He is talking about that same town, Bethlehem. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely. For then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you've created us for your glory. You've redeemed us as your treasure. And you have told us you are mine. You have delivered us. No more condemnation for our sins or fatherless living. No more giving into fear or making a name for ourselves. We are yours and your banner over us is love. Father, you don't promise freedom from hurricanes and floods, fiery seasons and difficult days, but you do promise you'll be with us and that we won't suffer ultimate harm. You're at work in all things for your glory and for our good. To know you are near and to know you are good is all we really need to know. And since you didn't spare your own son, we can trust you graciously to give us everything else we need. In Jesus' triumphant and trustworthy name we pray. Amen. May the grace of the Lord Christ Jesus and the love of the Father above and the presence and the power of the Spirit of God go with you this day and forevermore. Amen.